Um, good afternoon. So, yeah, um, I'm Floris. Uh, I've been a Python developer for um, quite a while now. Um, uh, in in my spare time, I'm quite often. Uh, sorry, can you can everyone hear me properly? Should I stand closer? Is that better? Okay. <laughs> sorry. Okay. So uh, yeah, I've been in, uh, involved in Python for quite a while. Uh, uh, I work on open source as well, uh, kind of usually around PyTest, uh, etc. Um, I have uh, very recently changed jobs and I'm now a, a site reliability engineer at Google. Uh, and while Kubernetes is at Google, originally came out of Google, this is not actually a uh, Google project, uh, Google talk, sorry. Um, this is la largely based on my experience from my previous job where um, I was working with um, microservices in Python uh, that we ran on Kubernetes. Um, a little note about the title, so uh, Kubernetes is uh, part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, CNCF, uh, and that's kind of where uh, the, the title kind of came from, so Cloud Native Python. Um, okay, so um, we'll be, um, this is kind of the contents that we'll uh, uh, be covering, so I'll start with like a very really, really brief introduction about Kubernetes, like probably the shortest introduction you can ever uh, have. But um, hopefully that should be, if you're not familiar with yet, that should be enough to kind of follow the rest of the, of the slides, really. Um, then I'll kind of introduce a little, a little example. Um, it's just a tr kind of traditional echo server, so it's a network server, you send the message, you get the same message back. Uh, and then we'll take, kind of take that example throughout throughout the rest of the talk to sort of start modifying it a little bit. So, introduction to Kubernetes, like this is kind of Kubernetes in one slide, uh, which is uh, a quite a, a tricky thing to do, I guess. But Kubernetes, the idea of Kubernetes is, is uh, that it's a, 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 con a cluster or orchestrator, really. So, the idea is that you give it a, a bunch of machines uh, and it, it creates a cluster out of it, and then when you want to run your application, you, you just say, run my application somewhere in this cluster. Um, and Kubernetes itself will decide where the right place in that cluster is, to, uh, is to, for your application to run. Um, and, and the kind of the, the, the aim that you're aiming for is to, the reason we, we, we want to build a, um, an architect, a, a system like this, uh, especially with like multiple microservices and you have multiple uh, instances of every uh, service, etc., is to make a really resilient application so that um, if one of the machines in the cluster is unhealthy or something, you can just take it down, you can fix it, replace it, and your application just keeps running. So if something crashes, you know, requests will just be rooted somewhere else, and you create a really resilient and, and uh, always up kind of application. That's the, that's the end goal of what you're trying to do, um, we're trying to run in, in Kubernetes. Um, so the core concept, so the core concept of uh, Kubernetes is like, you want to you want to run your application, and your application in our case is just going to be a, a Python application. So, um, uh, and Kubernetes runs kind of uh, containers essentially. So you need to containerize your your application. So right now that basically means uh, Docker. In the future, hopefully that will be also like a rocket and, and the like. So you you create a container out of your application. I'll skip over that part today. Um, and Kubernetes runs this inside of a pod. So a pod is kind of the smallest unit that Kubernetes will run for you. Essentially, it's just another wrapper for your container. Uh, you don't really have to worry why they decided to create a pod. Uh, it's kind of the, the idea is to like treat multiple, you can potentially put multiple containers inside one pod and treat it as one unit. Why you'd want to do that doesn't really matter for today. Um, so pod. You then uh, tell Kubernetes, please run this pod for me, which is your application. Uh, Kubernetes will kind of just find a server in its cluster and st start to run it for you. Uh, but the problem with pods is that they're kind of ephemeral. So they, um, if the pod gets killed for, for some reason, you know, an administrator goes rogue or a machine gets taken down or something like that, then your pod is gone. And that's, uh, that's, so that's a far cry from our resilient application. So, the next concept uh, that Kubernetes introduces is kind of this idea of a replica set. And a replica set is essentially, will, will kind of continuously um, look at what's running inside of Kubernetes. And the idea is that in your replica set, you say, I want to run this many instances of my application. So, um, 
and whenever whenever the replica set sees that these in, that your application isn't running that many times, it will try and uh, make sure that that happens. So if there's not enough of instances of, of your application, then it will create more runs. If there's too many, it, it will kill a few. Uh, so that means that you know machine gets taken down, the replica set will notice this and will create a new pod instead. So this is start. So this starts to like create your application to be always there, um, especially if you um, request multiple instances. The problem then is, of course, again, these, these pods, they just run on a random machine somewhere in your cluster. You don't know anything about them. You don't know how to contact them. So that's where the concept of this, um, the service comes in. So the service is essentially some sort of uh, a fixed IP address is, is the easiest way to think of inside your cluster. And the, um, if, you, if you need to contact your, your, your application, you can contact it via the service. And the service will essentially load balance between all the instances of your pod, and it will make sure if you send traffic to the service, it will go to one of the instances um, of your application that's running somewhere in the cluster. And these are really like the, the, the basic things about Kubernetes um, that, that's kind of enough to follow. Um, in a way, I'm, I'm now gonna say like everything else is bells and whistles. Um, there is lots of other layers. Um, they don't actually even re recommend you use replica sets directly at the moment. Uh, so there's obviously lots more going on. Um, but that's the core concept, and that's a core concept that allows you to create resilient applications. Um, so that should be enough for today, hopefully. So this is um, my little example application that I'll, I'll, I'll work with to, to add the rest. Um, it's basically an echo server, so on, on the network. Um, I've implemented it using ZeroMQ because um, anytime you want to create, uh, uh, you think of creating a, a TCP socket and you want to send and receive data, you, just, you should really use ZeroMQ instead because it takes care of a lot of the nitty gritty networking details and you get like whole messages automatically delivered to your application and you don't have to worry about everything else really. Other than that, this is fairly standard. Um, I should point out that all the code I show is kind of slideware, so I use globals, I don't show all the imports. Uh, you shouldn't write application like this, obviously. Um, uh, so, so yeah, this application basically, the, the main loop essentially is like, I create my socket that I want to listen on. Um, I then uh, use this polar uh, thing, which is basically if you've done um, normal TCP programming, it's like select. Uh, so essentially it's asking the operating system like, uh, uh, can I sleep until the next message is available? And then when, when the next message is available, that will kind of come as like an event. And then I, I basically pass the, the, so, the server socket, um, the echo server socket, uh, to, to the event handler for that. The event handler will, will, will then basically receive the message and send it back to me. Uh, so, so that's all this is. This is basically an infinite loop, receiving and, uh, receiving and sending the messages. Uh, so here are the few little helper functions that to, to make it fit on the slide. Um, so create and bind, uh, really nothing, just some plumbing. Uh, so create a socket, bind it so that we actually can receive connections. Uh, and we register it also into the uh, polar, again, using globals, et cetera. This is not nice code. Um, and the handler is and where, where the actual work, uh, work happens. Um, so we receive the message. Uh, again, do a little bit of ZeroMQ bookkeeping to uh, split off the, uh, the way ZeroMQ passes you the peer address. Um, and then uh, log, log the message uh, and then send, send it back to, to whoever sent it to us. So that's kind of the, the very simple application. Um, and the first thing to, to kind of um, notice is that that's actually kind of sufficient. So we can just take that application, uh, put like, you know, the if, main equals, uh, if name equals main thing in there, and uh, et cetera. And we can just containerize that uh, and, and run that as, as, as in, in our Kubernetes cluster, and that will just work. Um, so the, f the first thing to sort of um, rely on when you're, when you're in Kubernetes is sort of just rely on the fact that you are running in an environment, so you don't have to put complexity in your application. And it allows you to really have a very simple con uh, logical flow, which is kind of what we just saw was like a super simple, uh, straightforward internal architecture. And that's kind of true for larger applications as well. You, you can sort of uh, sk skip through all the, the boilerplate, et cetera. Um, and the first thing in that is like, I didn't write any exception handlers in that code. And sure, it's, it's, it fits on a slide, but that's actually generally quite tr uh, true. You can, um, you don't really have to worry about exceptions because your application runs in multiple instances. And if you do get something 
unexpected, like, I don't know, maybe the bind that could fail to, of the socket because whatever goes wrong on the machine, like, I don't really mind, like, this, the, my process will die and Kubernetes will just make sure that a new one gets created somewhere else instead and it will probably work. So, um, uh, yeah, so, so, so you don't have to worry about that especially. You can even go as far as kind of doing that for uh, when you're receiving data, so when you're receiving a request from, from some other service. If, you, if this other service is completely internal to yourself, so you're the actual, or your team or whatever is the, is the author of the other service, then essentially you can treat that uh, failed request as a bug. Uh, so, sorry, an invalid kind of uh, schema of, of the request kind of as a bug and you can basically crash again. If you're doing this for external applications, so if you're actually receiving user requests, then that is probably a bit uh, too eager, like, uh, or uh, too brittle. So in that case, you probably do want to catch the exception for, for request validation. Uh, because there is a little, there is, depending on application, I mean, in this case, not very much, but there is some overhead in starting up your application again. Uh, and the other thing that is kind of happens when you just crash and that you should take into account is that if you have network connection, uh, so you're receiving messages for, from some clients, uh, those network uh, connections, they, they will have buffers in them. So basically, there will be requests queued up already on, on your, in your local process. Zero so makes that really obvious because there is explicitly a queue with, with your socket. But even if you use raw TCP, there will always be um, there will always be uh, internal kernel buffers. Uh, the kernel may even have accepted new requests already and, and just queue them up, even though your application has no idea yet. There, there might be um, data still on the wire just coming over. And if you just crash, then you kind of lose that data. So uh, or the, those requests and, and whoever created those requests will have to then kind of wait and time out and retry. And uh, so so that, that's, that's not very good. Um, uh, yeah, so, so you want to take that kind of into account. And, in, and that kind of brings you to the more like uh, how do I organize my messaging, et cetera, and you can kind of start playing. If you really don't want to suffer from that, you can start playing with uh, message broker, brokers like RabbitMQ or uh, different systems like uh, Kafka, et cetera. But these all come with, you know, trade-offs, expenses. The only thing I would say, like, in, in, in here is basically, like, be aware of when you crash you may lose requests and, and make sure that that's okay in the system you're designing. So in this slide, um, this actually so, shows how you actually would create your, your this is the recommended way they, they want you to create your, um, your pods. Um, the deployment is essentially just a wrapper around this replica set thing. Uh, the reason they have it is because it creates um, updating your application slightly easier, but as far as from our point of view, the, the two important things here is this line that says replica three. Uh, that means we, we, we want we are requesting three replicas, so Kubernetes will always ensure that there's three of us running. And the other really important thing is the very last line that uh, says uh, restart policy always. Um, that that line will basically that tells Kubernetes that you know if we if we're crashing, just start us again, please. Um, so that's kind of um, first step. The second thing is like. Uh, you, the, the script had no concurrency, and while it was a very simple example, this is generally true. You can, you, you can rely on, uh, you, you can keep your internal code really simple, because uh, the idea is to scale via the process model. That's some sort of, uh, if you've ever heard of 12-factor apps uh, kind of methodology. Uh, that's kind of um, the idea of like, you just create more, you scale horizontally by creating more instances of our application. As so we just saw, that's kind of what you, you already did. Um, we just create more replicas, and they will handle the traffic. And that means that internally we can have really easy debugging, et cetera, because our control flow just gets really simple and we don't worry about any of the, uh, of, of, of the other stuff. Um, yeah, and basically your service, server is your load balancer in this case. So, um, uh, for, for, so this is kind of the, the service definition that we'd have. One thing again, one gotcha to look out for with, with this sort of load, uh, the service um, that you create, uh, which load balances your traffic between your pods is if your protocol that you're using uses long-standing connections, uh, which again, like ZeroMQ uh, in our example, points this out very well because ZeroMQ creates long-standing connections. You can connect and then it tries to reuse that connection for lots of requests and responses. So our Echo service will accept lots of um, Echo requests um, from, from, from the client. 
on one connection. So this means that essentially we don't get the uh, load balancing. So one client will permanently be connected to one of the pods uh, or one of our applications, essentially. Um, uh, and and so, so that's not very load balancing like. Um, well, on, on the other hand, if, if, you're, if you're using HTTP, then you know you get uh, a new TCP connection gets created for each request, and that would distribute automatically. The, the trick to, to use there is that Kubernetes actually allows you to see the layer below services, uh, and it has endpoints, uh, thing, uh, thing, objects it calls end, endpoints there. Um, and, and that actually allows you to see which, which endpoints, um, basically uh, IP addresses that are, are part of your service. And, and that, using that information so we could update our application to sort of query the Kubernetes API to ask um, what endpoints do I actually want to connect to. You can tell the Serum queue connect to all these endpoints. The downside is that you have to kind of work with the Kubernetes API. You need to be constantly aware that this can change. So when an endpoint disappears, you need to tell Serum queue, hey, the end disconnect from that endpoint, etc. Um, but that's just this generally, you know, uh, the sort of thing you need to be aware of uh, when, when you have long um, protocols that use long standing connections, basically. Um, next on, uh, talk a, bit, a little bit about logging. So you may have seen in, in, in my very first example uh, and cringed at this print statement. Um, so by default, uh, doc Docker kind of takes standard output of your container as, as log data. Uh, it, and Kubernetes will again take that log data from, from the Docker containers and will make that available to, to use. Uh, and generally the idea is that uh, at, at operations time you sort of hook that up to a log aggregator of some sort, something like Elasticsearch or FluentD or something like that. Um, uh, but using simple print statements is, is, is not very nice. Uh, in general, the, uh, you want to be able to control uh, log levels uh, at, at command line level. Again, that's sort of a 12 factor uh, app kind of thing. Um, so so you, you really want to use uh, logging libraries. Um, uh, yeah, um, so logging libraries are sort of uh, come in, uh, there's quite a few variations. Uh, and they all kind of try to wrap a horrible amount of global state into a nice API. And global state is always quite horrible, so they all kind of are ugly in one way or another. Um, I quite like logbook. Uh, there's not, I like, kind of like the way it, it tries, tries to handle the global state, but there's nothing inherently better about logbook than, than, than the standard library logging, if you like standard library logging. Um, one nice thing about logbook is that you can use the normal curly braces formatting to new style uh, formatting instead of percent formatting from uh, standard library logging. But the main thing here is to notice that once you start li using a logging library, you can actually start, uh, you, you can hook up your logging library to, instead of printing out to standard out, which is kind of the first thing you, you probably do because if you don't have all the infrastructure yet, um, but you can hook it up to send, send the log records directly to the aggregator. And this allows you to, like, if, if you have tracebacks or something, you can send them as, as a sim single big block. So the next thing that you really, uh, really want to do as soon as you start using a logging library is um, wrap your main, main application in, into, uh, a, a, in, into basically this, log, uh, this exception logging. Uh, our logging libraries will support some sort of variation of this. But the idea here is that uh, by doing this, I make sure that any unhandled exception, as I was advertising earlier, Will, will be um, captured by the logging library and will be sent as one single log record uh, back, to the log, back to your logging aggregator. Um, so next on is kind of um, this concept that communities called health endpoints. Um, and the idea here is that, uh, the, the central idea here is that when, you, when your application starts up, um, Kubernetes has said, it, you know, start this container, and as soon as that container is kind of running from, from, from a process point of view, it, it's available. So the service object that, that you created for, for your application will start sending traffic to you. But there is a finite amount of time that your application is running, and you haven't opened your socket yet, and you're not listening for connections yet. Um, in this case, obviously, it will be very small, but if you have a lot of setup and things you have to do before you start uh, accepting connections from clients, that delay might be bigger as well. And the problem is, if at that point Kubernetes is sending traffic to your, to your um, application, then you're basically saying refused connection, and all these clients are like, well, the service is down. So 
you don't want to do that. And what Kubernetes does is it, it introduces these uh, readiness probes. Um, and the idea there is basically that um, Kubernetes, like after starting your application, it will wait until the probe succeeds. Uh, and once the probe succeeds, only then it will start sending traffic to, to your application. This is kind of how you configure that in, in, in the Kubernetes YAML configuration. Um, uh, in, in our case, so there's several different uh, probes you can use. In our case, um, it's just a simple echo server. So all we care about really from the probe's point of view is that the socket is open and listening. So this TCP socket probe um, essentially says, like, as soon as you have, um, a, a, as soon as this socket create, uh, accepts connections, um, send me traffic. Uh, Kubernetes will literally just try and connect to the socket and as soon as there's a connection close and say, yeah, okay, I'll send it traffic. Uh, so that means there's still kind of a tiny delay in which like, we might actually have bound our socket, but not yet process, not yet in the main loop of processing some messages. But because we know the buffering and, and the queuing in, in, in our sockets um, take care of this, that's basically perfectly fine. That will be a short amount of time that some requests get queued up. But we'll start serving them very shortly. Um, if, you're using, if your service is actually using HTTP as uh, transport, it uh, kind of has built-in support for that. And there is this convention of using this uh, health Z route. Um, and basically, this is really nice in a way because you can basically tell your, uh, the, the readiness probe is kind of completely in line with, with or can be if you, if you, if you create it so, as such, to be completely in line with your normal request processing. So if that actually returns, um, so basically Kubernetes only looks for the 200 OK on there. Um, so as soon as that returns 200 OK, it will start sending you traffic. Uh, and because you can do this completely in line, you actually have some quite high assurance that yes, my, my application is fully running and, and can start serving traffic. Um, so the same concept of, of kind of uh, readiness uh, also, uh, the same concept also, also happens uh, for, for during the pod's lifetime, really. So when your application is running, uh, especially when you're, when you're running your application at, at a large scale and it handles lots of requests, sometimes things will just go wrong and, and one, of, one, of the instance, one of the many instances will start misbehaving. This might be because of external things like there's another container on that box that even though things should be isolated, they're not always as isolated as you would imagine and like things go terribly wrong or someone decided to run a, a backup on that machine and things go really slow or all sorts of things happen right, really. Um, and the pro so, so the, the, the idea of liveness probes is that you don't want to be sending requests to, to uh, an application that, that's slow to respond or, or is just completely stuck or something like that. It does this uh, in, in essentially a very, very similar way. So um, it just has this liveness probes thing. And um, this shows kind of the third type of, of probe that you can use. So we've already seen like TCP socket. Uh, and, and HTTP GET, and here I decided to use the uh, exec one. Exec is kind of the most work, um, but it's also, it's also the most flexible. So the problem is like the, the TCP one that we used for readiness, and it was very suitable there, it's like not very useful for um, the liveness probe. Uh, and what we really want is, is kind of the same as, as, this, um, as you can use with the HTTP GET. It's like we want to know in line, like is, is th are things working correctly? So the trick you do there is this, this exact command um, basically says, it gives you the command line that you want to execute inside of your container. So you have to provide an extra binary inside of your container, which will ideally like tell how healthy or not healthy um, you, you, your, that pod is. Um, and ideally you, you, you want to aim for this inline checking. So um, that's exactly what I've done here. I've added an extra script. Um, in, in my application, and I just invoke it with um, Python. So this is kind of the, the, how simple the script can be. Again, obviously, I have a very simple uh, application, but um, literally, I just create a socket, connect it to, to the, the public endpoint. In this case, because I'm running on the same container, it's actually on localhost, but we still make the TCP connection, so this still gives us a very high kind of uh, idea of like, what the public um, uh, behaviors of, of, of our application. And we just send uh, a message and we wait for like 500 milliseconds. And if we haven't got the, a message back yet at that time, uh, th then, then we fail. And then Kubernetes will start taking your, our pod out of, 
uh, uh, basically stop sending traffic to our pod and send it to the healthy ones instead. Um, you may notice I'm not actually even receiving my, my response. I just check, hey, there is a response. Uh, in this case, I think that is sufficient. Um, so it depends on, on the protocol you, you have or, or the sort of um, yeah, messaging you use. Sometimes you might want to uh, introduce slightly more. And often it is nice to build in something like that, um, well, the, uh, the health set kind of uh, route to that in the HTTP convention. Um, ju just something that you know it is working. Um, um, yes, just something that you know it is working uh, and everything is fine. Uh, so that's the idea of liveness. So next on is like uh, termination. Um, and again, this is like very similar. If you thought about how we, you know, at startup time, we don't really want to, we didn't want to refuse any connections. At termination time, we, we don't want to drop any uh, connections that exist. Uh, so, so any requests that are currently uh, queued up on, on our process, if we just say, oh, we've been asked, if we don't do anything, basically, our application will just uh, receive termination signal and it will just die. And all the requests that are queued up will basically be lost and all the clients will be there waiting again. So that's not very good. So instead, we should handle the, the termination signal, which is done in Kubernetes just like it's always been done in, in Unix systems. Uh, you basically get um, wise, yeah, via Docker, uh, um, but you get SIG terms sent to you. Um, and the signal handler here that, that we create is, is just a very simple uh, internal socket. It's essentially, I think of it as a pipe. And all we want to do is like send this signal, like I'm sending a single byte um, to, to my main loop, and then my main loop know, knows it has to shut down. Uh, and um, yeah, and it can shut down while trying to handle the connections. Um, I'm, I'm using the same signal handler here for both SIGTERM and SIGINT. SIGINT is the, is the signal that you get when you press Ctrl-C normally when you're running on a terminal. So in Python, that normally gets uh, automatically translated to keyboard interrupt uh, exception. Um, because you want your application to kind of behave in the same way when you're running um, when, when you're running on the tester to try. It's usually best practice to just bind both the signal handlers. The modifications for, for my main loop are maybe a little bit uh, more messy now, but essentially it's, it's, it's not that much. So I just, again, create, uh, instead of create, um, creating just one socket in my main loop, I create two sockets. Uh, so I add, add this termination socket, I add it to the polar. And when I now receive, um, the important thing here is when, is when I receive this, this new, um, uh, this single byte, basically. I don't even care what, what that byte is, by the way. Again, I just know, oh, I received the message from my termination socket, so I need to shut down. And here, I, um, I first unbind, so uh, this, this means that I um, will, will stop receiving uh, new connections. Um, and then I basically keep processing. While there are still events in the queues, I keep processing. And I have also, I set the timeout actually to like five seconds or something, which may be fairly high. But the idea here is that some, some requests might actually already be on the wire, and I want to give those a chance to, to be processed well. And once there are no longer any, any messages in my queue, I, the, the, the while loop will finish and I return. Um, so the, um, so the last thing uh, that I would, uh, like to add is um, kind of uh, monitoring. So Prometheus is, is, a, uh, is, is another uh, Cloud Native Computing Foundation project, actually, uh, which is uh, kind of why I mention it. And the idea here is like to start, uh, you always want to know kind of what's going on. And Prometheus is kind of um, uh, offers you this, this option of doing white box monitoring in, in a way. So you can add counters and you can add metrics to inside your application. You can, uh, start start en uh, enriching your metrics collection basically. So Prometheus works in a very um, in a in a pool based fashion. Uh, so you have the central infrastructure and it will go around to all your all your services and it will do an HTTP request and, and get back your, your metrics basically. Um, it's a little bit like um, SMP SNMP over HTTP if you remember the SNMP pool medal. Um, but at least we learned that you know monitoring data is probably even more important than production. Uh, uh, traffic, so we actually use a reliable TCP transport instead of something like UDP. Um, anyway, uh, um, Prometheus is obviously a very uh, difficult and um, a big project, but the idea is here that I really want to show is just how easy it is to get started with it, and, and you can just add very little things. There is a, last year there was a talk about from Hinek, I think, at Europe, uh, Python, 
um, which goes in a lot more detail about Prometheus. So this is kind of, uh, yeah, the recap. Like The idea is basically none of this is actually strictly required to be able to run on Kubernetes. You can adopt this gradually as, as you need. Um, and yeah, to keep your architecture simple, uh, think about when you lose requests and um, you don't want to go blind basically, so always you always want to have some instrumentation and monitoring. Um, thank you very much. I think I'm about out of time. Uh, so unfortunately, there probably won't be any questions, but you can find me outside if you like.